Hi. Um. Sorry it took me so long. I was playing a lot of video games. Um. Just kind of lazy. Sorry. But um, we're back. Back at the stand. Got a treat for you guys. I'm gonna read chapters four and five today. So it's gonna be a bit of a longer video. But um, stick around. It'll be good. So here we go. Also, sorry. Before I go. I noticed that, like, on chapters 2 and 3, there's, like, way less views. So, if y'all skipping chapters, I'm gonna be pissed. Anyways. It was an hour past nightfall. Starkey sat alone at a long table, sifting through sheets of yellow flimsy. The contents dismayed him. He had been serving his country for 36 years, beginning as a scared West Point club. He had won medals. He had spoken with presidents, offered advice, and on occasion, his advice had been taken. He had been through dark moments before, plenty of them, but this, he was scared. So deeply scared he hardly dared admit it to himself. It was a kind of fear that could drive you mad. On impulse, he got up and went to the wall where the five blank TV monitors looked into the room. As he got up, his knee bumped the table, causing one of the sheets of the flimsy to fall off the edge. It seesawed lazily down through the, through the mechanically purified air and landed on a towel, half in the table's shadow and half out. Someone standing over it would it and looking down would have seen this. OT confirmed. Seems reasonably string coded 848AB can't be on W Sally antigens shift and mutation. High risk excess mortality and communicability estimated repeat 99.4%. Atlanta Plague Center understands. Top secret blue folder ends. PT 222312A. Starkey pushed a button under the middle screen and the picture flashed on with the unnerving suddenness of solid state components. It showed the western California desert looking east. It was desolate, and the desolation was rendered eerie by the reddish purple tinge of infrared photography. It's out there, straight ahead, Starkey thought. Project Blue. The fright tried to wash over him again. He reached into the pocket and brought out a blue pill, what his daughters would call a downer. Names didn't matter, results did. He dry swallowed it, his hard, unseen face wrinkling for a moment as it went down. Project Blue. He looked at the other blank monitors and then punched up pictures on all of them. Four and five showed labs. Four was physics. Five was viral biology. The Vi by lab was full of animal cages, mostly for guinea pigs, rhesus monkeys, and a few dogs. None of them appeared to be, appeared to be sleeping. In the physics lab, a small centrifuge was still turning round and around. Starkey had complained about that. He complained bitterly. That was something, there was something spooky about that centrifuge whirling gaily around and around and around while Dr. Eswick lay dead on the floor nearby, sprawled out like a scarecrow that had tipped over in a high wind. They had explained to him that the centrifuge was on the same circuit as the light, and if they turned off the centrifuge, the lights would go too. And the cameras down there were not equipped for infrared. Starkey understood. Some more brass might come down from Washington and want to look at the dead Nobel Prize winner who was lying 400 feet under the desert less than a mile away. Turn off the centrifuge, we turn off the professor. Elementary, what his daughter would have called a catch-22. He took another downer and looked at the monitor, too. This was the one he liked least of all. He didn't like the man with the face, with his face in the suit. Suppose someone walked up to you and said, you will spend eternity with your fizz in a bowl of soup. It's like the old pie-in-the-face routine. It stops being funny when it starts being you. Monitor 2, monitor two showed the Project Blue cafeteria. The accident occurred almost perfectly between shifts, and the cafeteria had only been lightly populated. He'd suppose it hadn't mattered much to them whether they had died in the cafeteria or in their bedroom or their laps. Still, the man with the face in the suit. A man and a woman in blue coveralls were crumpled at the foot of the candy machine. A man in a white coverall lay beside the Seaberg jukebox. At the, tables, at the tables themselves were nine men and fourteen women. Some of them still slumped beside Hostess Twinkies. Some with spilled cups of Coke and Sprite still clutched in their stiff hands. And at the second table, near the end, there was a man who had been identified as Frank D. Bruce. His face was a, in a bowl of what appeared to be Campbell's chunky sirloin soup. The first monitor showed only a digital clock. Until June 13th, all the numbers on that clock had been green. Now they turned bright red. They had stopped. The figures read, I'm not even going to try it. That's a big number. Basically, day, month, year, time. June 13th, 1990. 37 minutes past 2 in the morning. That's 16 seconds. From behind him came a brief burring noise. Starkey turned off the monitors one by one and then turned around. He saw the sheet of flimsy on the floor and put it back on the table. Come. It was Creighton. He looked grave and his skin was a slatty color. More bad news, Starkey thought serenely. 
Someone else had taken a long, high dive into a cold bowl of chunky sirloin soup. Hi, Len, he said quietly. Len Creighton nodded. Billy, this. Christ, I don't know how to tell you. I think one might word at a, at a time might go best, soldier. Those men who handled Campion's body are through their prelims at Atlanta, and the news isn't good. All of them? Five for sure. There's one, his name is Stu Redman, who's negative so far. But as far as we can tell, Campion himself was negative for over 50 hours. If only Campion had it run, Starkey said. That was sloppy security, Len. Very sloppy. Creighton nodded. Go on. Arnett has been quarantined. We've isolated at least 16 cases of constantly shifting A-prime flu there so far. And those are just the overt ones. The news media? So far, no problem. They believe it's anthrax. What else? One very serious problem. We have a Texas Highway Patrolman called Joe Bob Brentwood. His cousin owns the gas station where Campion ended up. He dropped by yesterday morning to tell Hapscomb the people were coming. Picked him up three hours ago and he's en route to Atlanta, around, Atlanta now. In the meantime, he's been patrolling half of East Texas. God knows how many people he's been in contact with. Oh, shit, Stark, he said, and was appalled by the watery weakness in his voice and the skin crawl that started near the base of his testicles and was now working up into his belly. 99.4% communicability, he said, he thought. It played insanely over and over in his mind. And that means 99.4% excess mortality because the human body couldn't produce the antibodies necessary to stop a constantly shifting antigen virus. Every time the body did produce the right antibody, the virus simply shifted to a slightly new form. For the same reason, a vaccine was going to be almost impossible to create 99.4%. Christ, he said. That's it? Well, go on, finish. Softly then, Creighton said, Hammer's dead, Billy. Suicide. He shot himself the, in the eye with a service pistol. The Project Blue specs were on his desk. A little tired. <laughs> I guess he thought leaving them here were all, was all the suicide note anybody would need. Starkey closed his eyes. Vic Hammer was, had been, his son-in-law. How was he was supposed to tell Cynthia about this? I'm sorry, Cindy. Vic, to Vic took a high dive into a cold bowl of soup today. Here, have a downer. You see, there was a goof. Somebody made a mistake with a box. Somebody else forgot to pull a switch that would have sealed off the base. The lag was only 40-some seconds, but it was enough. The box is known in the trade as a sniffer. It's made in the Port Portland, Oregon Defense Department, Department contract 16448096. The boxes are put together in separate circuits by female technicians, and they do it so that, that way so none of them really know what they're doing. One of them was maybe thinking about what to make for supper, and whoever was supposed to check her work was maybe thinking about trading the family car. Anyway, Cindy, the last co Cindy, the last coincidence was that a man at the number four security post, a man named Campia, saw the numbers go red just in time to get out of the room before the door shut and mag locked. Then he got his family and ran. He drove through the main gate just four minutes before sirens started going off and we sealed the whole base. And no one started looking for him until nearly an hour later because there are no monitors in the security post. Somewhere along the line you have to stop guarding the guardians or everyone in the world would be a goddamn turkey. And everybody just assumed he was in there, waiting for the sniffers to sort out the clean areas from the dirty ones. So we got him some running room and he was smart enough to use the ranch trails and lucky enough to not to pick any of the ones where his car could get bogged down. Then someone had to make a command decision on whether or not to bring in the state police, the FBI, or both of them and that fable buck got packed hither, thither, and yon. And by the time someone decided the shop ought to handle it, this happy asshole, this happy the seas asshole, had gotten to Texas. When they finally caught him, he and when they finally caught him, he wasn't running anymore because he and him and his family and his baby daughter were all laid out on cooling boards in some peasant little town called Braintree, Braintree, Texas. Anyway, Cindy, what I'm trying to say is this was a chain of incompetence thrown in for good luck. A chain of coincidence on the order of winning the Irish sweepstakes with a little incompetence thrown in for good luck, for bad luck. I mean, please excuse me. But mostly it was a thing that just happened. None of it was your fo man's fault. But he was the head of the project and he saw the situation start to escalate. And then, thanks, Len, he said. Billy, would you like, I'll be up in 10 minutes. I want you to schedule a general staff meeting 10 mi 15 minutes from now. If they're in bed, kick them out. Yes, sir. And Len, yes. I'm glad you were the one that told me. Yes, sir. Creighton left. Starkey glanced at his watch, then walked over to his monitors and into the wall. He turned on two, put his hands behind his back, and stared thoughtfully into Project Blue's silent cafeteria. I'm so sorry for the way I stuttered that during that chapter. That's horrible. So basically, Starkey's this army guy. Project Blue is the virus that just got out with Campion, and things are going to shit. Chapter 5. Larry Underwood pulled around the corner and found a big parking space for the Dad Z between a fire hydrant and somebody's trash, that it, trash can that had fallen into the gutter. There's something unpleasant in the trash can, and Larry tried to tell himself that it really hadn't 
that he really hadn't seen the stiffening dead cat and the rat gnawing at its white furred belly. That rat was gone so fast in the sweep of his headlights that it really might not have been there. The cat, however, was fixed in stasis, and and he supposed killing the disease engine. If you believed in one, you had to believe in the other. Didn't they say that Paris had the biggest rat population in the world? All those old sewers. But New York did pretty well, too. And if you remember, it has misspent youth well enough. Not all the rats in New York City went on four legs. And what the hell was he doing parked in front of this decaying brownstone thinking about rats anyways? Five days ago, on June 14th, he had been su- in sunny Southern California, home of Hopheads, Freak Religions, the only CW nightclubs in the world with go-do- go-go dancers, and Disneyland. This morning, at quarter of four, he had arrived on the shore of the other ocean, paying his toll to go across the tri- Triborough Bridge. A sudden drizzle had started falling. Only in New York can an early summer drizzle seem so unrepentantly sullen. Larry could see the drops accreting on the Z's windshield now, as imitations of dawn began to creep into the eastern sky. Do you, New York? I've come home. Maybe the Yankees were in town. That might make the whole trip worthwhile. Take the subway to the stadium, drink a beer, eat hot dogs, and watch the Yankees walk the piss out of Cleveland or Boston. His thoughts had drifted off, and when, he, and when they wandered back to him, he saw that the light had gotten much stronger. The dashboard clock read 6.05. He had been dozing. The rat had been real, he saw. The rat was back. The rat had dug himself quite a hole in the dead cat's guts. Larry's empty stomach did a slow forward roll. He considered beeping the horn to skip horn to scare it away for good, but the sleeping brown stones with their empty garbage cans standing sentinel duty dotted him. He slouched lower in the bucket seat so he wouldn't have to watch the rat eating breakfast. Just a bite, my good man, and then back to the subway system. Going out to old Yankee Stadium this evening? Perhaps I'll see you, old chump, although I really doubt you'll see me. The front of the building had been <laughs> defaced with spray can slogans, cryptic, cryptic and ominous. Chico 116, 093, little AB1. When he had been a boy before his father died, this had been a good neighborhood. Two stone dogs had guarded the steps leading up to the double doors. A year before he took off for the coast, Vandals had demolished the one on the right from the four paws up. Now they were both entirely gone, except for one rear paw of the left dog. The body had been called into creation to support the body it had been called into creation to support had entirely vanished, perhaps decorating some Puerto Rican junkies crash pad. Maybe Zero ninety three or little A B number one had taken it. Maybe the rats had carried it away into some deserted subway tunnel one dark night. For all he knew, maybe they had taken his mother along, too. He supposed he should at least climb the steps and make sure her name was still there under the apartment 15 mailbox, but he was too tired. Nah, he would just sit in here and nod off, trusting to the last residues of reds in his system to wake him up about seven. Then he would go to see if his mother still lived here. Maybe it would be the best if she was gone. Maybe then he wouldn't have bothered with the Yankees. Maybe he would just go check in a little bit more, sleep for three days, and then head back into the Golden West. And this light in this drizzle, with the legs and head still throwing from the bring down, glowing from the bring down. New York had all the cha- charm of a dead whore. His mind began to drift away again, mulling over the last nine weeks or so, trying to figure out some sort of key that would make everything clear and explain how you could butt yourself against stone walls for six long weeks, playing for clubs, making demo tapes, doing sessions, the whole bit, and then suddenly make it in nine weeks. Trying to get that straight in your mind was like trying to swallow a doorknob. There had to be an answer, he thought, an explanation that would allow him to reject the ugly notion that the whole thing had been a whim, a simple twist of fate, Dylan's words. He dozed deeper, arms crossed on his chest, going over and over it, and mixed up in all of it was this new thing, like this low and sinister counterpoint. One note at the threshold of audibility played on a synthesizer, heard in my grainy sort of way that acted on you much like a premonition. The rat, digging in the dead cat's body, munch munch, just looking for something tasty here. It's the law of the jungle, my man. If you're in the trees, you gotta swing. It had really started 18 months ago. He had been playing with the tattered remnants in a Berkeley club, and a man from Columbia had called. Not a biggie, just another toiler in the vinyl vineyards. Neil Diamond was thinking of recording one of his songs, a tune called Baby, Can You Dig Your Man? Diamond was doing an album, except for... All his own stuff, except for an old Buddy Holly tune, Peggy Sayer got married, and maybe this Larry Underwood tune. The question is, would Larry like to come up and cut a demo of the tune and then sit in on the session? Diamond wanted a second acoustic guitar, and he liked the tune a lot. Larry said yes. The session lasted three days. It was a great one. Larry met Neil Diamond, also Robbie Robertson, also Richard Perry. He got mentioned on the album's inner sleeve and got paid Union Scale. But baby, can you dig your man, never even made the album. On the second evening of the session, Diamond had come up with a new tune of his own, and that made up the album instead. Well, the man from Columbia, that's too bad. It happens. Tell you what, why don't you cut the demo anyways? I'll see if there's anything I can do. So Larry cut the demo and found himself back out on the street. In L.A., times were hard. 
There were a few sessions, but not many. He finally got a job playing guitar in a supper club, crooning things like softly as I leave you in Moon River while elderly cats talk business and sucked up Italian food. He wrote the lyrics on scraps of note paper because otherwise he tended to mix them up and forget them all together, according to the tune whenever, while he went, hmm, hmm, ta-da, hmm, trying to look like suave like Tony Bennett vamping and feeling like an asshole. In elevators and supermarkets, he had become morbidly aware of the low music that played constantly. Then, nine weeks ago, and out of the blue, the man from Columbia had called. They wanted to release his demo as a single. Could he come in and back it? Sure, Larry said. He could do that. He had gone into Columbia's L.A. studios on a Sunday afternoon, double-tracked his own voice on Baby Can You Dig Your Man in about an hour, and then backed it with a song he had written for the Tattered Remnants, Pocket Savior. The man from Columbia presented with him a, presented him with a check for $500 and a stinker of a contract that, Larry, that bound Larry to more it than... The man from Columbia presented him with a check for $500 and a stinker of a contract that bound Larry to more than it did the record company. He shook Larry's hand, told him it was good to have him aboard, offered him a small pitting smile when Larry asked how the single would be promoted, and then took his leave. It was too late to deposit the check, so Larry ran through his repertoire of chinos with it in his pocket. Near the end of his first set, he sang a subdued version of Baby, Can You Dig Your Man? The only person who noticed was Gino's proprietor, who told him to save the bad word beep pop for the cleanup crew. Seven weeks, seven weeks ago, the man from Columbia called again and told him to go get a copy of Billboard. Larry ran. Baby, can you dig your man was one of three hot prospects for that week. Larry called the man from Columbia back, and he had asked Larry how, how he would like to lunch with some of the real biggies to discuss the album. They were all pleased with the single, which was already getting airplay in Detroit, Philadelphia, and Portland, Maine already. It looked as like it was going to catch, and it won a late-night Battle of the Sounds contest for four nights running on one Detroit Soul Station. No one seemed to know that Larry Underwood was white. He had gotten drunk at the luncheon and hardly noticed how his salmon tasted. No one seemed to mind that he had gotten loaded. One of the biggies said he wanted to be surprised to see Baby Can You Dig Your Man carry off a Grammy next year. It all rang gloriously in Larry's ears. He felt like a man in a dream and going back to his apartment he felt strangely sure he'd be hit by a truck and that it would end it all. The Columbia biggies had presented him with another check, this one for 2500 When he got home, Larry picked up the telephone and began to make calls. The first one was to Mort Gino Green. Larry told him he'd have to find someone else to play Yellow Bird while the customers ate his lousy undercooked pasta. Then he called everyone he could think of, including Barry Greig of the Remnants. Then he went out and got standing up, falling down, drunk. Five weeks ago, the single had cracked Billboard's High 100, number 89, with a bullet. That, that was the week spring had really come to Los Angeles, and on a bright and sparkling May afternoon, with the building so white and the ocean so blue they could knock your eyes out and send them rolling down your cheeks like marbles, he had... <laughs> he had heard his record on the radio for the first time. Three or four friends were there, including his current girl, and they were moderately done up on cocaine. Larry was coming out of the kitchen out and into the living room with a bag of Toll House cookies when the familiar KLMT slogan came on. Neo music. I don't know if I did that right. I'm sorry to any KLMT listeners if I did that wrong. And then Larry, and then Larry had been transfixed by the sound of his own voice coming out of the Technic speakers. I'm not even going to read the lyrics. Baby, can you dip your nap? Jesus, that's me, he had said. He dropped the cookies onto the floor and then stood gate mouth and stone flabbergasted as his friends applauded. Four weeks ago, his tune had jumped to number 73 on the billboard chart. He began to feel as, as if he had been pushed rudely into an old-time silent movie where everything was moving way too fast. The phone rang off the hook. Columbia was screaming for the album, wanting to capitalize on the single success. Some crazy rat's ass of an a r man called three times one day telling him that he had to get into record one, not now, but yesterday, and record a remake of the McCoy's Hangout Sloopy as the follow-up. Monster, this mor moron kept shouting. Only follow-ups that's possible, Lair. He had never met this guy, and already well, he wasn't even Larry, but Lair. It'll be a monster. I mean, a fucking monster. Larry had a lot, at last lost his patience and told the monster shouter, foreshadowing, Given a choice between recording Hang On Sloopy and being tied down or receiving a Coca-Cola enema, he would pick the enema. Then he hung up. The train kept rolling just the same. Assurance that this could be the biggest record in five years poured into his dazed ears. Agents called by the dozen. They all sounded hungry. He began to take uppers and it seemed to him that he heard a song everywhere. One Saturday morning he rolled on Soul Train and spent the rest of the day trying to make himself believe that yes, that actually happened. It became suddenly hard to separate himself from Julie, the girl he had spent it since he had been dating since his gig in Chinos. She introduced him to all sorts of people, few of them he really ever wanted to see. Her voice began to remind him of the prospective agents he heard over the telephone. In a large, in a long, loud, arc, 
acrimonious argument, he split with her. She had screamed at him that his head would be too so- would soon be too big to fit through a recording studio door, and that he owed her five hundred dollars for dope, and that he was the nineteen nineties answer to Sagar and Evans. She threatened to kill herself. Afterwards, he had felt as though he had been a- through a long pillow grade in which all the pillow pillow fight in which all the pillows had been treated with a low grade poison gas. They had been cutting. They had been. They had been cutting the album for th- three weeks ago, and Larry had withstood most of the for your own good suggestions. He used what leeway the contract gave him. He got three of the tattered re- remnants, Barry Greig, Al Spellman, and Johnny McCall, and two other musicians he had worked with in the past, Neil Goodman and Wade Stuckey. They cut the album in nine days, absolutely all the studio time they could get. Columbia seemed to want an album based on what they thought could, would be a 20-week career, beginning with Baby Can You Dig Your Man and ending with Hang On Sloopy. Larry wanted more. The album cover was a photo of Larry in an old-fashioned clawfoot tub full of suds. Written, written on the towels above him and a Columbia secretary's lipstick were the words Pocket Savior and Larry Underwood. Columbia had wanted to call the album Baby Can You Dig Your Man, but Larry absolutely balked, and finally they had settled for it contains the hit single Stick Around the Shrink Wrap. Two weeks ago, the single hit number 47 and the party gets started. You rented a, a Malibu beach house for a month, and after that, things get a little hazy. People wandered in and out, always more of them. He knew some, but mostly they were strangers. He can remember being huckstered by an even more agent who wanted to further his great career. He can remember a girl who had been bum-tripped and gone screaming down the bone-white beach as naked as a nuthatch. He can remember stoning coke and chasing it with tequila. He can remember being shaken awake on Saturday morning, it must have been a week or so ago, to hear Casey Kasem's Spanish record as a debut song at number 36 on the American Top 40. He can remember taking a great many reds and vaguely dickering for the dance on sea with a $4,000 royalty check that had come in the mail. And then it was June 13th, six days ago, the day Wayne Stuckey asked Larry to go for a walk with him down the beach. It had only been 9 in the morning, but the stereo was on, both TVs, and it sounded like an orgy was going on in the basement playroom. Larry had been sitting in an overstuffed living room chair, wearing only underpants and trying owlishly to get the sense from a Superboy comic book. He felt very alert, but none of the words seemed to connect to anything. There was no Jesus. A Wagner piece was thundering from the quad speakers, and Wayne had to shout three or four times to make himself understood. Then Larry nodded. He felt as if he could walk for miles. But when the sunlight struck Larry's eyeballs like needles, he suddenly changed his mind. No walk. Uh Uh-uh. His eyes had been turned into magnifying glasses, and soon the sun would shine through them long enough to set his brains on fire. His poor brains felt tinder dry. Wayne, Wayne gripped his, gripping his arm furly, insisted. They went down to the beach over the warming sand of the darker brown horror pack, and Larry decided it had been a pretty good after all. The deepening sound of the breakers coming home was soothing. A gall working to gain, altitu- gain al- altitude, hugged straining in the blue sky like a sketched letter, white letter M. Wayne tugged his arm firmly. Come on. Larry got all the miles he felt he could walk, except that he no longer felt that way. He had an ugly headache, and his spi- spine felt as if it had turned to glass. His, eye- his eyeballs were pulsing, and his kidneys ached dully. An amphetamine hangover is not as painful as the morning after the night you got through a whole fifth of four roses, but it is not as pleasant as, say, bawling Wel- Rackwell Welch would be. If he had n- at another cup of uppers, he could have climbed neatly on top of this eight ball that wanted to run him down. He reached in his pocket to get them and for the first time became aware that he was clad only in skivvies that had been fresh three days ago. Wayne, I want to go back. Let's walk a little more. He thought that Wayne was looking at him strangely with a mixture of exasperation and pity. No, man, I only got my short time. I'll get picked up for indecent exposure. On this part of the coast, you could wrap a bandana around your wing wang and let your balls hang free and still not get picked up for indecent exposure. Come on, man. I'm tired, Larry said querously. He began to feel pissed at Wayne. This was Wayne's way of getting back at him because Larry had a hit album and he, Wayne, only had a keyboard credit on the new album. He was no different than Julie. Everybody hated him now. Everybody had the knife out. He, his eyes blurred with easy tears. Come on, man, Wayne repeated and they struck up off the beach again. They had walked, they had walked perhaps another mile when double cramps struck the big muscles in Larry's thighs. He screamed and collapsed under the sand. It felt as twin stilettos had been planted in his flesh at the same instant. Cramps, he said. Oh, m- cramps, he screamed. Oh, man, cramps. Larry squatted beside him and pulled his legs out straight. The agony hit again, and then Wayne got to work, hitting the knotted muscles and eating them. At last, the oxygen starved tissues began to loosen. Larry, who had been holding his breath, began to gasp. Oh, man, he said. Thanks. That was, that was bad. Sure, Wayne said, without much sympathy. I bet it was, Larry. How are you now? Okay, but let's just sit, huh? Then we'll go back. I want to talk to you. I had to get you out of here, and I wanted you straight enough that you could understand what I was laying on you. 
What's that, Lane? Wayne? He thought, here it comes, the pitch. But what Lane said seemed so far from a pitch that it seemed for a moment he was back with a Superboy comment trying to make sense of a six-word sentence. The party's got to end, Larry. Huh? The party. When you go back, you pull all the plugs, give everybody their car keys, thank everyone for a lovely time, and see them at the front door. Get rid of them. I can't do can't do that, Larry said, shocked. You better, Wayne said. But why, man? But why? Man, this party's just getting going. Larry, how much has Columbia paid you up front? Why would you want to know, Larry asked slyly. Do you think I want to suck off you, Larry? Think. Larry thought, and with dawning bewilderment, he realized there was no reason why Wayne, Dawes, Wayne, <laughs> Wayne Dawson, Wayne Stuggy would want to put the arm on him. He really hadn't made it yet, was scuffling for jobs like most of the people who had helped Larry cut the album, but unlike most of them, Wayne came from a family with money and he was on good terms with his people. Wayne's father owned half of the country's third largest electronic games company, and the Stuckies had a modestly palatial home in Bel Air. Bewildered, Larry, Larry realized that his own sudden good fortune probably looked like small bananas to Wayne. No, I guess not, he said gruffly. I'm sorry, but it seems like every tin horn cock, cockroach waster, l- chaser west of Las Vegas. So how much? Larry thought it over. Several grand up front, all told. They're paying you quarterly royalties on the single and biannually on the album, right? Wayne nodded. They hold it until the eagle screams, the bastards. Cigarette? Larry took one and cupped the end for a light. You know how much this party's costing you? Sure. Larry Larry said. You didn't rent the house for less than a thousand. Yeah, that's right. It actually been twelve hundred plus a five hundred dollar damage deposit. He paid the deposit and half the month's rent, a total of eleven hundred with six hundred owing. How much for dope? Oh man, you have to Wayne asked. Oh man, you gotta have something. It's like cheese for Ritz crackers. There was pot and there was coke. How much? Come on. The fucking DA, Larry said sulkily. Five hundred and five hundred. And it was gone the second day. The hell it was, Larry said, startled. I saw two bulls when we went out this morning. Most of it was gone, yeah, but man, don't you remember the deck? Wayne's voice suddenly dropped into amazingly good parodies of Larry's own drawing voice. Just put it on my tab, do we keep him full? Larry looked at Wayne with dawning horror. He did remember a small wire guy with a peculiar haircut, a wiffle cut they had called, called it 10 or 15 years ago. A small guy with a wiffle haircut and a t-shirt reading Jesus is coming and he is pissed. <laughs> Sweet shirt. This guy seemed to have good dope practically falling out of his asshole. He didn't even remember telling this guy, do we the deck, to keep his hospitality bowls full and put it on his tab. But that had been, well, that had been days ago. Wayne said, you're the best thing to happen to do with the deck in a long time, man. How much is he into me for? Not bad on pot. Pot's cheap. Twelve hundred. Eight grand on coke. For a minute, Larry thought he was going to puke. He goggled silently at Wayne. He tried to speak and could only mouth. Ninety-two hundred. Inflation, man, Wayne said. You see, want the rest? Larry didn't want the rest, but he nodded. There was a colored TV upstairs. Someone ran a chair through it. I'd I'd guess three hundred dollars for repairs. The wood paneling downstairs had been gouged to hell. Four hundred with luck. The picture window facing the beach got broken the day before yesterday. Three hundred. The shag rug in the living room is totally kaput. Cigarette burns, beer, whiskey. Four hundred. I called the liquor store and they're just as happy with their tab as Deck is with his. Six hundred. Six hundred for booze. Larry whispered. Blue horror had encased him up to the neck. Be thankful most of them have been scoffing beer and wine. You got a four hundred dollar tab down at the market, mostly for pizza, chips, tacos, all that good shit. But the worst is the noise. Pretty soon the cops are going to land lace fleeks, stirring the peace, and you've got four or five heavies doing up on heroin. There's three or four ounces of Mexican brown in this place. Is that on my tab, too? Larry asked hoarsely. No, the deck doesn't mess with the heroin. That's an organization item. The deck doesn't like the idea of cement cowboy boots. But if the cops land, you can bet the bus will go on your tab. But I don't know, just a babe in the woods, yeah. But your total tab for this little shindy comes out so far to over $12,000. You went and picked that little Z off the lot. How much did you put down? Twenty-five, Larry said numbly. He felt like crying. So what have you got until the next royalty check? A couple thousand? That's about right. Unable to tell Luane that he had less than about less than that. About eight hundred split evenly between cash and checking. Larry, you listen to me because you're not worth telling twice. There's always a party waiting to happen. Out here, the only two constants are the constant bullshitting and the constant party. They come, come running like dicky birds looking for bugs on a hippo's back. Now they're here. Pick them off your carcass and send them on their way. Larry thought of the dozens of people in the house. He knew maybe one in, per, one in three people at this point. The thought of telling all those unknown people to leave made his throat want to close up. He would lose their good opinion. Opposing this thought came an image of Dewey the Deck refilling the hospitality rules, taking a notebook from his back pocket and writing it all down at the bottom of his tab. 
him and his wiffle haircut and his trendy t-shirt. Wayne watched him calmly as he squirmed between these two pictures. Man, I'm going to look like the asshole of the world, Larry said, finally hating the weak and petulant words that came out of his mouth. Yeah, they'll call you a lot of names. They'll say you're going Hollywood, getting a big head, forgetting your old friends. Except none of them are your friends, Larry. Your friends saw what was happening three days ago and split. It's no fun to watch a friend who's, like, pissed his pants and doesn't even know it. So why tell me, Larry said, suddenly angry. The anger, anger was puddled out of him by the realization that all his, really all his good friends had taken off, and in retrospect, their excuses seemed lame. Barry Greig had taken him aside, tried to talk to him, but Larry had been really flying, and he had just nodded and smiled indulgently at Barry. Now he wondered if Barry had been trying to lay the same shit on him. It made him embarrassed and angry to think so. Why tell me, he repeated. I get the feeling you don't like me so goddamn much. No, but I don't really dislike you either. Beyond that, man, I couldn't say... I could have just let you get your nose punched on this. One would have been enough for you. What do you mean? You'll tell him. Because there's a hard streak in you. There's something in you like that's biting, like biting on tinfoil. Whatever it takes to make success, you've got it. You will have a nice little career. Middle of the road pop, no one will remember in five years. The junior high boppers will collect your records. You'll make money. Ju Larry balled his fist on his legs. He wanted to punch that calm face. Wayne was saying things that made him feel like a pile of dog shit outside of Sobstein. Go on back and pull the plug, Wayne said softly. Then you get in that car and go. Just go, man. Just stay away until you next know that next royalty check is waiting on you. But Dewey, I'll find a man to talk to Dewey. My pleasure, man. The guy will tell Dewey to wait for his money like a good little boy, and Dewey will be happy to oblige. He paused. Watching two small children in, small bathing suit, in bright bathing suits run up the beach. A dog ran beside them, roofing loudly and cheerily at the blue sky. Larry stood up and forced himself to say things. Sea breeze slipped in and out of his aging shorts. The word came out of his mouth like a brick. You just go away somewhere and get your shit together, Wayne said, standing up beside him, still watching the kids. You got a hell of a lot of shit to get together. What kind of manager you want? What kind of tour you want? What kind of contract you want after pocket save your hits? I think it will. Let's get that neat little beat. If you give yourself some more room, you'll figure it all out. Guys like you always do. Guys like you always do. Guys like me always do. Guys like... Someone was tapping a finger on the window. Larry jerked and sat up. A bolt of pain went through his neck and he winced at the dead, crampled feel of the flesh there. <laughs> he had been asleep, not just dozing. We live in California. But here, but here and now it was gray New York daylight and the finger tapped again. He turned his head cautiously and painfully and saw his mother wearing a black ska black net, net scarf over her hair, peering in. For a moment, they just stared at each other through the glass, and Larry felt cur cur curiously naked, like an animal being looked at in the zoo. Then his mouth took over, smiling, and he cranked the window down. Ma, I knew it was you, he said in a queerly, she said in a queerly flat tone. Come on out of there and let me see what you look like standing up. Both legs had gone to sleep, pins and needle tingled, tingled up from the balls of his feet as he got up. Get, uh, as he opened the door and got out. He never expected to meet her this way, unprepared and exposed. He felt like a century had fallen asleep, but his pose suddenly called to attention. He had somehow expected his mother to look smaller, less sure of himself. Less sure of herself. A trick of the years that almost matured him and left her just the same. But it was almost uncanny the way he had caught, she had caught him. When he was ten, she used to wake him up on Saturday mornings after she thought he had slept long enough by tapping one finger on his closed bedroom door. She had awakened him the same way 14 years later, sleeping in his new car like a tired kid who had tried to stay up all night and got caught by the same man in an undignified position. Now he stood before her, his hair corkscrewed, a faint and rather foolish grin on his face. Pins and needles so coursed up his legs, making him shift from foot to foot. He remembered that she always asked him if he had to go to the bathroom when he did that, and now, he's, now at will he stopped the, stopped the moment, stopped the movement, and let the needles prick him at will. Hi, Ma, he said. She looked at him without saying anything, and a dread suddenly roosted in his heart like an evil bird coming back to an old nest. It was a fear that she might turn away from him, deny him, show him the back of her cheap coat, and simply go off to the subway around the corner, leaving him. Then she sighed the way a man will sigh before picking up a heavy bundle. And when she spoke, her voice was so natural and so mildly, rightly pleased, that he had forgotten his first impression. Hi, Larry, she said. Come on upstairs. I knew it was you when I looked out the window. I already called and sick in my building. I got sick time coming. He turned to lead him back up the steps between the vanished stone dogs. He came three steps behind her, catching up, wincing at the pins and needles. Mom. Mom? She turned back to him and he hugged her. For a moment, an expression of fright crossed her features and she expected to be mugged rather than hugged. Then it passed and she accepted his embrace and gave back her own. The smell of her satchet slipped up the nose, evoking unexpected nostalgia, fierce, sweet, and bitter. 
For a moment, he thought he was going to cry and was smugly sure that he would. It was at a touching moment. Over her sloped right shoulder, you could see the dead cat lying half in and half out of the garbage can. When she pulled away, her eyes were dry. Come on, I'll make you some breakfast. Have you been driving all night? Yes, he said. His l voice lightly hoarse with emotion. Well, come on, elevator's broken, but it's only two floors. It's worse for Mrs. Halsey with her arthritis. She's on five. And don't forget to wipe your feet. If you track in, Mr. Freeman will be on me like a shot. I swear gosh, you can smell dirt. Dirt's his enemy, all right. They're on the stairs now. Can you eat three eggs? I'll make toast, too, if you don't mind pumpernickel. Come on. He followed her past the vanished snowed dogs and looked a little wildly as they had been, just to assure himself that they were really gone and that he had not shrunk two feet, that the whole decade of the 1980s had not vanished back into time. She pushed the doors open and they went in. Even the brown, dark brown shadows and the smells of cooking were the same. Alice Underwood fixed him three eggs, bacon, toast, juice, and coffee. When he had finished all but the coffee, he lit a cigarette and pushed back from the table. She flashed the cigarette a disapproving look, but said nothing. That restored some of his confidence. Some, but not much. She'd always been good at biding her time. She dropped the iron, spi the iron spider skillet into the gray dishwater and it hissed a little. She hadn't changed much, she, Larry was thinking. A little older, she'd be 51 now. A little grayer, but there was still plenty of black left in that sensibly netted head of hair. She was wearing a plain gray dress, probably the one she worked in. Her bosom was still the same comb or blooming out of the bodice of the dress. A little larger, if anything. Mom, tell me the truth. Has your bosom gotten bigger? Is, is that the fundamental changes? That's so weird. I don't know why he says that. He started to tap cigarette ashes into his coffee saucer. She jerked it away and replaced it with the ashtray she always kept in the cupboard. The saucer had been sloppy with coffee and it seemed okay to tap it in. <coughs> the ashtray was clean, repro reproachfully spotless, and he tapped it in with a slight pang. She could bite her time and keep you springing small traps onto you until your ankles were all bloody and you were ready to start gibbering. So you came back, Al has said, taking a used brillo from a talk, table talk pie dish and work, putting it to work on the skillet. What brought you? Well, Ma, this friend of mine clued, into me, clued me on the, on the facts of life. The asshole's traveling packs and this time they're after me. I don't know. I don't know if friend is the right word for him. He respects me musically about as much as I respect the 1910 Fruit Gun Company. But he got me got me to put on my ra traveling shoes and it wasn't, wasn't it Robert Frost who said home is a place that when you go there they have to take you in? Aloud, he said. I guess I got to miss you, Mom. She snorted. That's why you wrote me often? I'm not much of a letter writer. He pumped a cigarette tr slowly up and down. Smoke rings formed from the tip and drifted off. You can say that again, smiling, he said. I'm not much of a letter writer. But you're still smart to your mother. That hasn't changed. I'm sorry. How have you been, Mom? He said. She put the skeleton in the drainer, pulled the sink stopper, and wiped the lace of soap suds from her right in hand. Not too bad, she said, coming over to the table and sitting down. My back pains me some, but I got my pills. I make out, all right. You haven't thrown it out of whack since I left? Oh, once, but Dr. Holmes took care of it. Mom, those chiropractors are just frauds. He bit his tongue. Or what? He shrugged uncomfortably in the face of her hooked smile. You're free, white, and 21. If, she help, if he helps you, fine. She sat and took a roll of wintergreen lifesavers from her dress. I'm a lot more than 21, and I feel it. Want one? He shook his head with the lifesaver she had thumbed up. She popped it into her own mouth instead. You're just a girl yet, he said, with a touch of his old bantering flattery. She had always liked it, but now it only brought a ghost of a smile to her lips. Any new men in your life? Several, she said. How about you? No, he said seriously. No new men. Some girls, but no new men. He'd hoped for laughter, but the only got only the ghost smile yet. I'm troubling her, he thought. That's what it is. She doesn't know what I want here. She hasn't been waiting for three years for three years for me to show up, but after all, she only wanted to see me to stay lost. Same old lair, she said. Never serious. You're not engaged? Seeing anyone steadily? I play the field, Ma. You always did. At least you never get, came home to tell me that you got some nice Catholic girl in a family with. I'll give you that. You were either very careful, very lucky, or very polite. He strove to keep a poker face. It was the first time that she had ever mentioned sex to him, directly or obliquely. Anyway, you're going to learn. They say bachelors have all the fun. Not so. You just get old and full of sand, nasty the way that Mr. Freeman is. He's got that sidewalk-level apartment, and he's always standing there in the window, hoping for a strong breeze. Larry grunted. I hear that song song you got on the radio. I tell people, that's my son. That's Larry. Most of them don't believe it. You have heard it? He wondered why she hadn't mentioned that first instead of going all into all this piddling shit. Sure, all the time that rock and roll station the young girls listen to. W-R-O-K. Do you like it? As well as I like any of that music. She looked at him firmly. I think some of it sounds suggestive. Lewd. He found himself shuffling his feet and forced to stop. It's supposed to sound passionate, Ma, that's all. His face su <laughs> suffused with blood. 
He had never expected to be sitting in his mother's kitchen discussing passion. The place for passion is the bedroom, she said curtly, closing off any aesthetic discussion of his record. Also, you did sign to your voice. You sound like a bad word. Now? Now? He asked, amused. No, on the radio. That brown sound, she do get around. She sure do get around, he said, Larry said, deepening his voice to Bill Withers' level and smiling. Just like that, she nodded. When I was a girl, we thought Frank Sinatra was daring. Now they have this rap. Rap, they call it. Screaming, I call it. She looked at him grudgingly. At least there's no screaming on your record. I get a royalty, he said. A certain percent of every, every record sold. It breaks down to, oh, go on, she said, and made a shooting gesture with her hand. I flunked all my mass. Have they paid you yet, or did you get that little car on credit? They haven't paid me much, he said, skating up to the edge of the line, but not quite over it. I made a down payment on the car. I'm financing the rest. Easy credit term, she said balefully. That's how your mother, that's how your father ended up bankrupt. The f doctor said he died of a heart attack, but it wasn't that. It was a broken heart. Your dad went to his grave on easy credit terms. This was an old rap, and Larry had just let it flow over him, nodding at all the right places. His father had owned a haberdashery. A Robert Hall had opened up not too far away, and a year later his business had failed. He had turned to food for solace, putting on 100 pounds in three years. He had dropped that in the corner luncheon at where Larry was nine, a half-finished meatball sandwich on his plate in front of him. At the wake, when his si her sister had tried to comfort a woman who looked absolutely without need of comfort, Alice Underwood said it could have been worse. It could, she said, looking past her sister's shoulder and looked directly at her brother-in-law. Could have been drink. Alice brought Larry the best of the rest of the way up on her own, dominating his life with prober her proverbs and prejudice until he left home. Her last remark to him as he and Randy Sh Rudy Schwartz drove off in Rudy's old Ford was that they, were, they had poor houses in California, too. Yes, sir, that's my mama. Do you want to stay here, Larry? She asked softly. Startled, he countered. Do you mind? There's room. The rollaway's still in the back bedroom. I've been storing things back there, but you can move some of the boxes around. All right, he said slowly. If you sure don't mind. I'm only in for a couple of weeks. I thought I'd look some of the old guy. Mark, Galen, David, Chris, those guys. She got up, went to the window, and tugged it up. You're welcome to stay as long as you like, Larry. I'm not so good at expressing myself, but maybe. But I'm glad to see you. We didn't say goodbye very well. There were harsh words. She showed him her face, still harsh, but also full of a terrible, reluctant love. For my part, I regret them. I only said them because I love you. I never knew how to say that just right, so I said it in other ways. That's all right, he said, looking at the, down at the table. The flush was back. He could feel it. Listen, I'll chip in for shit. You can if you want. If you don't want to, you don't have to. I'm working. Thousands aren't. You're still my son. I thought of the Stephen and Cat, half in and half out of the trash can of Dewey the Deck, smilingly filling the hospitality bowls, and he suddenly burst into tears. As his hands blurred double in the wash of them, he thought that this should be her bit, not his. Nothing had gone the way he thought it would. Nothing. She had changed all, after all. So had he, but not as he, ex as he expected. An unnatural reversal had occurred. She had gotten bigger and he had somehow gotten smaller. He had not come home to her because he had to go somewhere. He had come home because he was afraid and he wanted his mother. She stood by the open window watching it. The white curtains fluttered in on the damp breeze, obscuring her face, not hiding, hiding, hiding it entirely but making it seem ghostly. Traffic sounds came in through the window. She took the handkerchief from the bodice of her dress and walked to the, over to the table and put it in one of his groping hands. There was something hard in Larry. She could have taxed him with it, but to what end? His, mother, his father had been a softy, and in her heart of hearts, she knew that it was that which had really sent him to the grave. Max Underwood had been done in more by lending credit than taking it. So when it came to that hard streak, who did Larry have to think? Or blame? His tears couldn't change that stony outcropping in his character more than a single summer cloudburst could change the shape of rock. There were good uses for such hardness. She knew that and had known it as a woman raising a boy on her own in a city that cared little for mothers and less for their children. But Larry hadn't found any yet. He was just what she had said he was, the same old Larry. He would go along, not thinking, getting people, including himself, at a jam, and when the jams got bad enough, he would call upon that hard street to extricate himself. As for the others, he would leave them to sink or swim on their own. Rock was tough, and there was toughness in his character, but he still used it destructively. She could see it in his eyes, reading every line of his posture, even the way he bobbed his cancer stick to make those little rings in the air. He had never sharpened that hard piece of him into a blade to cut people with, and that was something, but when he did needed it, he was still calling on it as a child did as a bludgeon to beat his way out of traps he had dug himself. Once she had told herself Larry would change. She had, he would. But this was no boy in front of her. This was a grown-up man, and she feared that his days of change, the deep and fundamental sort of minister called a change of soul rather than one of heart, were long behind him. There was something in Larry that gave you the bitter zing of hearing chalk screech on a blackboard. Deep inside, looking out, was only Larry. He was the only one allowed inside his heart, but she loved him. But she also thought there was good in Larry, great good. It was there, but this lady would take nothing short of a catastrophe to bring it out. There was no catastrophe here, only her weeping son. 
You're tired, she said. Clean up. I'll move the boxes, then you can sleep. I guess I'll go in today after all. She went down the short hall to the back room, his old bedroom, and Larry heard her grunting and moving boxes. He wiped his eyes slowly. The sound of traffic came in the window. He tried to remember the last time he had cried in front of his mother. He thought of the dead cat. She was right. He was tired. He'd never been so tired. He went to bed and slept for nearly 18 hours. So that's the end of chapter 5. Um, We just got a shit ton of Larry Underwood backstory. He ends up becoming one of our main characters. So, yeah. Thank you for watching. See ya.